Okay, so it's uh, now two minutes past ten, and um, as I say, welcome to, to this our uh, second Local Energy Systems webinar. Um, as we go along, uh, please feel free to type your questions into the chat function. We are not using the questions function, we're using the chat function. So if you want to make any comments or ask questions as we go along, please just uh, type those into the, uh, the chat bar, including, for example, if for some reason we lose signal um, or you can't hear the sound for some reason. And as I say, we will be recording this um, and the slides and the, the webinar broadcast will be available later uh, after the webinar is completed. So uh, you may remember we had a, a webinar last year, an introduction to um, local energy system concepts, and we provided an overview of the typology matrix we developed to try and categorize the various concepts. And we did that using case studies to illustrate significant characteristics of the various projects and case studies we've been looking at. Um, following on from that, we were asked a number of questions regarding the economics of local energy systems. Uh, which we will address here today. Um, we're also planning um, further webinars on the subject of local energy systems. Um, the subjects we're considering at the moment are about customer attitudes to the localization of energy, uh, the regulatory challenges and policy support uh, issues across Europe, and the role of energy communities in the energy transition. Sorry, technical bit there. Um, so the agenda we're looking at today. Um, first of all, I'll have a brief introduction to Delta EE and the local energy systems team. Um, then provide a brief introduction to uh, local energy systems. Um, this will be a recap of uh, the uh, the overall uh, content of the, the previous webinar um, to provide some context and to uh, provide a. a uh, sort of a reminder for people who um, weren't able to attend the last um, webinar. We'll then have a, an overview of general business models for local energy systems and then look at one particular business model uh, which is becoming very interesting across Europe which is collective self-consumption and then um, a more detailed look at the German Mieterstrom model uh, and then I'll wrap up and we'll have Q&A. So uh, introduction, firstly, just a very brief uh, overview of, of Delta EE for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we're a, a research and consultancy company. Um, the research services we offer, you can see here, uh, a wide range across the whole um, energy transition, um, including the right-hand side at the top there, the Local Energy Systems Research Service, which is the framework in which we've undertaken uh, the research for this um, webinar today. Uh, I'm joined by um, my four colleagues here, or three colleagues, sorry. Um, um, I will do the overview of the local energy system business models, and then Lodovica will um, look at more detail on the, uh, the German Mieterstrom model. Uh, and my other two colleagues, Lucy and Rita, will be available at the end to answer questions on their particular areas. So um, can I just ask uh, Lucy if you can just briefly introduce yourself and what you're doing? You may be on mute. Sorry, yeah, I was on mute. Um, hi everyone. So I'm currently working on a database for case studies in local energy systems, ranging from sort of pure microgrids all the way through to just generation ones. And in addition to that, I'm also looking at legislations that sort of help or hinder local energy systems. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Ludovica, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Um, I am Ludovica Di Diodato, and I've just finished a case study on the local energy system in Germany, and I'm going to talk you through the Mieterstrom model, which is the collective self-consumption variant in Germany. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Rita, if you're able to uh, join and introduce yourself. 
Rita's not currently on the line, unfortunately. We have some technical issues. Okay. Although Rita currently is working on the collective self-consumption models. Okay, well, hopefully she'll be back online by the time we get to the, the Q&A session at the end. Um, okay, so moving on then. Um, the A bit of background to local energy systems. As I say, this is um, the, the area we looked at um, last time. And as we said during the last webinar, the, the question we keep getting asked is about how people can make money out of local energy systems. Um, and as we said then, one of the challenges in answering that question is that different people have different definitions of what actually constitutes a local energy system. And we developed this typology um, when we first launched the service last year. And we've been trying to make sure that the case studies we come across all fit within this matrix so that we understand the, the complexities and the, uh, the specific characteristics of uh, the kind of um, business models which we can look at. So on the far left hand side there you can see the um, community distributed energy resource integration. That is simply things like um, communities which own renewable resources. Um, and then the, the next column, the local energy systems with multiple connections, these tend to be systems where the uh, local energy system is overlaid on the, uh, the conventional infrastructure using the distribution networks and the trading systems of the, uh, the existing uh, supply business. Um, the next column, which we call bounded but not islandable, uh, also people refer to as campus systems, and these can be hospitals, university campuses, and essentially these are systems with um, probably a single point of connection to the, to the wider grid um, and where the distribution and generation and consumption all take place within a bounded physical um, network. And then taking that a step further, the far right hand side are microgrids, which are islandable systems, so the same as a campus system, but with the additional ability to disconnect from the, the wider grid if necessary, and in some cases, uh, fully islanded, permanently islandable, uh, sorry, permanently islanded uh, microgrids uh, on remote islands and so on. Um, and it is an important framework to consider when we're looking at business models, because the, the business model which applies in these very different configurations have very different characteristics. They have very different uh, potential uh, revenue streams, uh, and different technical and regulatory constraints. So, as we saw before, the, there's a need to move from subsidy to, to value-driven systems. Um, in the early days of local energy systems, schemes are often characterized by niche requirements, such as the lack of a conventional electricity supply. And in this case, the cost of providing electricity was secondary to simply having an available, reliable supply. So the business models there will be very different from the commercial requirements uh, where you're competing with alternative um, conventional supply. Um, also early on, many local energy systems grid connected were typically dependent on subsidies, either in the form of grants or an ongoing basis with feed-in tariffs, for example. Um, and as technology costs have fallen and these schemes become viable in their own right, then the subsidies are being withdrawn and the need to find um, alternative, more sustainable value driven business models. And that's what we see with things like the, uh, the scheme on the right hand side, the, the sort of combined heat and power uh, using cogeneration of uh, power supplied to an industrial estate uh, or business park rather, uh, and heat and power supplied to the housing as well uh, next to it. So that's just a, a brief intro to the um, the overall framework of what the different local energy systems are. And now we're going to look at the business models which uh, apply to those. Now there are any number of uh, business models uh, with varying degrees of maturity, complexity, economic viability. Um, mature business models, uh, which generally seek to optimize self-consumption include the campus schemes I referred to, uh, in which the heat and power generated by the scheme is used on site and distributed over the client's own network, generally to a single um, uh, off-taker, a single client. Um, and as I say, the extension of this is the microgrid in which the campus is, is islanded or can be islanded, and that can provide resilience 
uh, to the, um, the consumers within that. Um, and that adds further value, particularly for critical infrastructure schemes. Um, and both those concepts are dependent on the ability to uh, produce and distribute energy on site at a lower cost than the alternative grid supply. And that they become increasingly effective as technology costs fall and the potential value of flexibility and resilient services is realized. Um, those of you who attended the first webinar may recall this, this graphic, which um, illustrates the emerging viability of a microgrid model. Uh, it represents effectively an evolution of the existing relatively, relatively mature business model, which can compete economically with conventional grid supply already. Um, and you can see how the alternative cost of producing and supplying electricity falls with time as the cost of renewable resources falls. And what it's showing there is the top, the dotted line is the uh, projected uh, forward cost of electricity from conventional supply for the next 10 years or so. Um, and then the, uh, the medium line there showing a reducing LCOE for um, the microgrid supply on the assumption that the technology costs um, reduce with time and then the lower line which is the same as the the other microgrid one except that uh, the system is optimized to stack values from flexibility services and possibly also from uh, resilient services so you can see that already today that there are instances where with a, an appropriate cost of capital and this is based on quite a low cost of capital about three percent um, and for UK costs construction and so on um, it is already competitive with conventional supply. However, we're going to be looking today at a range of other business model concepts right across the local energy system space uh, that we've defined in that typology matrix right at the beginning, uh, including some quite innovative approaches. Um, and you might ask why people are looking at the innovative models, which generally speaking have limited economic value uh, they offer societal and environmental benefits, but in economic terms, they're very challenged. One of the, the great distinctions of these innovative models is that unlike campus schemes or microgrids where you need a discrete uh, construction, which may in some cases even duplicate the existing network, these innovative models are being developed to try and make use of the existing infrastructure so that you don't need to invest in uh, the cabling and so on of a, building a duplicate system. Um, but of course, that means you are then uh, tied to the, uh, the existing infrastructure, distribution infrastructure that is, and the need to recompense the, the owner and the operator of that. So before we look at the business model themselves, let's take a look at the fundamentals of where the value originates. And generally speaking, there are two main categories of values. The first, which is outlined here, derives from the avoidance of energy spy tariffs. Uh, for imported grid electricity. Um, and this, of course, has to offset the investment cost in the generation resource within the, the local energy system. Um, but of course, after falling cost of renewables has led to a situation in which this value alone is sufficient to recover the investment, this can be quite an attractive approach. Um, but the important thing to note on this uh, pie chart here is that you can only avoid the cost of the tariff components that you are avoiding. So, for example, if you are trading electricity over the public network, then you will have to pay the network charges. Uh, and generally speaking, those will be fixed regardless of the, the application. So that the only uh, value that you can create or trade is that 32% on the, uh, the lower right hand side, which is typical for most European markets. About a third of the, the tariff cost tends to be the um, the actual energy, the wholesale energy cost, uh, with the remainders split equally between uh, network costs uh, and taxation and compliance costs. So, having said that, clearly, if you can, in the case of self consumption, for example, you can avoid the 100% of that cost by consuming your own electricity. But ideally, um, you want to be able to stack additional revenue streams if it is possible. So, we then come on to the uh, the second uh, series of um, income streams, uh, and that's based on system values. Now, system values are, are very different from tariff values because the tariff values is a, a value fixed on the, the tariff that you're paying, uh, whereas system values really can be set at any level, um, which is required to incentivize delivery of a service 
or to reflect, for example, mitigation of external costs such as um, carbon mitigation. And these fall into broadly three areas. Um, the subsidies, um, which are becoming increasingly legacy values, which were designed to encourage the uptake of renewable generation and may reflect the external costs such as carbon mitigation. Um, those were things like feed-in tariffs, green certificates, other certificates, tradable certificates, that is, um, capital grants, guarantee schemes, tax exemptions. Um, but as I said earlier, as the, the cost of the technologies is reducing um, to con conventional, you know, competitive with conventional sources, these subsidies are being withdrawn um, and being replaced with what we might consider cost-reflective values, such as trading excess generation with peers or for flexibility services. So, as I say, the second area, um, flexibility values, can be significantly higher than the simple avoidance of tariff components. Um, interestingly, some observers believe that the flexibility market may become saturated, but uh, experience to date has been that with the growth of intermittency um, and the, you know, the growth in uh, demands for electrification of heat and transport, there is a corresponding increase in the size and value of this market, which applies both at the distribution level and the uh, the transmission, the, the total energy system level. And ideally, you want to be able to stack the, the, the flexibility values as well as the tariff values. The third area, which uh, has value, which is quite difficult to quantify uh, or very difficult to, to capture, is about resilience. And there are two parts of this. Uh, one is the local resilience, uh, and that refers to the service to customers within a local energy system. So for example, within a microgrid, the uh, resilience is provided by um, storage and generation within the microgrid itself, which allows the system to operate even when the, the grid to which is connected fails. So that's what I would call internal resilience. But then the other area is what we might refer to as external or system resilience, in which uh, a microgrid can actually support the wider energy system. And it can do that by, for example, uh, supporting, helping to support the, um, the restarting of the system, the black start after a total grid failure. Uh, it can also have benefits in mitigating some of the impacts of um, automatically tripping out um, uh, renewable generators, which were one of the causes of the event in the UK uh, in August last year. So if we now look at the uh, the business models themselves, um, starting here with what I would call successful business models in terms of delivering economic benefits. Um, clearly, the uh, definition of success depends on what you're trying to achieve. And uh, looking here, we're looking purely at the economic side of things. So, as I mentioned before, self-consumption models are pretty well established, both at the individual um, house level or um, larger buildings. Um, but also on uh, university co hospital campuses and so on. And effectively, what they try to do is simply to minimise the amount of power which is generated and transported into the network uh, and maximising the amount which is consumed within the, uh, the system itself. So that's a fairly simple uh, business model. Um, it requires some uh, technical um, intelligence to do that in terms of prioritising loads so that you uh, Prioritise, for example, the, uh, the use of your own generation uh, for instantaneous demands from appliances, for example, um, and then maybe you store the excess in battery storage. And if you then have that, it's full as well, then it may make economic sense to, to dump that excess beyond the electrical needs into heat, for example, in the form of um, hot water heating. Um, that's only the case where there is a higher value from the, the value of hot water than for the, the export tariff, which you might be paid for exporting it. So that, that's the sort of fundamentals of self-consumption. Uh, and microgrids, very similarly, also try to maintain their uh, generation within the, the system, again, to maximise value, but they enhance that value by providing resilience. Um, and the, the business models there are very similar, but with the, the added uh, value components. And then we look at uh, community-owned renewable generation, and the viability of that is simply regarding the, uh, the availability of, uh, in many cases, very good subsidies. Um, but 
it is already the case that in some instances, uh, renewable generation, uh, even on a PPA basis, is economically viable. And that will be increasingly so as the cost of renewables continues to fall. Moving on to some of the more challenging business models. Now, as I mentioned before, these are systems which generally operate over the existing network um, and therefore face the challenges of value erosion by having to pay for the use of system costs, but also with the potential benefit of using the existing infrastructure and possibly optimizing the, uh, the utilization of that resource. Um, but there's key questions around uh, how you reflect the, uh, the true costs and values um, of operating these systems over the, the public network. And of course, that raises questions about the role of the network operators and the other stakeholders within the, the energy system. The two most common, um, what we would call transactive energy concepts, are peer-to-peer -peer trading and collective self-consumption. Um, we'll come on to collective self-consumption in a minute, but fundamentally peer-to-peer -peer trading is about trading between prosumers, that's consumers who also have generation assets, typically households with PV on the roof, um, trading their excess power um, with other consumers uh, on the same network using a virtual trading platform. Uh, important to note that um, that energy is transported across the public network, even though the transaction may be directly uh, in financial terms between the prosumers and the, and the consumers. Um, the collective self-consumption is somewhat different in that rather than individuals having their own physical assets, uh, typically it is a uh, some kind of communal asset which uh, is shared virtually amongst members of a local energy community. So I'll go into the uh, general explanation of the collective self-consumption before we go on to the specific German model. So how the collective self-consumption actually works. You have a communal asset or assets, uh, in this case indicated by the, the solar farm on the, the top left there. Um, and the output of that is shared virtually across the public network. Um, and you can see, I think clearly here, that the, the trading takes place uh, on the platform um, between the generation, the, the virtual allocation of the generation and the consumers who are part of that community. But the physical transport of electricity takes place over the, the public network. Um, and there's clearly a requirement here for a balancing responsible party uh, to provide the uh, necessary uh, energy to supplement any deficit from the the uh, DER resource, um, which is owned by the, uh, the community. Interestingly, it means that rather than the individuals having to invest in their own uh, generation assets, they're able to um, share in a, a communal asset which means that, for example, people who live in apartment blocks who couldn't install their own PV system can participate in uh, investment in the, the new energy system by um, sharing in this virtual allocation. Um, it can reduce the average unit cost of supply of electricity. Uh, effectively, it smears the lower cost of their uh, self-generated units, assuming they are lower, of course, uh, across the conventional the balancing supply. Um, in some cases, the tariffs they're offered uh, provide explicitly different rates for each resource at different times of day even. Um, and one of the, the key issues is it, it, it creates a sense of community and particularly encourages localization of um, not just the trading, but also the installation and maintenance and so on of a collaborative effort. Uh, but you do still need an intermediary to um, capture additional value uh, from aggregated flexibility, for example. Um, and as I mentioned before, a substantial part of the value trading is eroded by network compliance costs. Having said that, there are uh, moves to consider ways of reflecting those uh, system costs more effectively. Um, but at the moment, that is fairly poorly uh, defined. And there is a, a, a great deal of confusion about the uh, appropriate levels and methodologies for charging for use of system. Um, the initiative at EU level, there's two directives which have been implemented to encourage the uh, implementation of uh, citizens' energy communities and renewable energy communities. 
um, and those are being currently transposed into national legislation. But um, as is inevitable with these things, uh, the interpretations are very different uh, in different countries uh, regarding the technical limits uh, for um, locational pricing, for example, should be based on geography or the voltage levels. Um, and it may be that uh, capacity-based systems or maybe recovery of only the low voltage network costs is appropriate. Um, but in, in one case, in France, for example, um, entities are actually charging a higher fee than the standard um, because they argue uh, not unreasonably that at this stage, the administrative costs of managing a uh, collective self-consumption scheme outweigh any savings in the use of the system. Um, and that probably will change in due course as the, uh, the systems become more efficient. But there's certainly a long way to go in terms of the need for regulatory change to reflect the realities of the system. So that's just a, an introduction to collective self-consumption overall. I'm now going to hand up to, uh, to Lotto to talk about the specific case of the uh, collective self-consumption in Germany called Mieterstrom. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so um, yes, as you said, a lot of confusion in terms of uh, legislation to translate the European directives uh, in the member states. But here I'm here to present you the Mitterstrom that since 2017 represent the um, German variant of collective self-consumption and it, pro it, it promotes the collective self-consumption from a renewable energy system, specifically PVs or micro CHP, when located in the same premises or building among the tenants that occupy the premises or the building. I would like to highlight three main points that would help us to understand the Mitterstrom scheme. The Mitterstrom allows grid fees and concession levy avoidance for energy consumed behind the meter. When I talk about the meter, I talk about um, what, is, what is indicated here as the Summenzela um, in the diagram that you can see. The energy, the EEG umlage, however, which is the surcharge that in Germany is paid by energy consumer to finance the installation of distributed renewable energy systems. So it's something that every energy consumer in Germany has to pay in his, in his energy bill, stay in place. So the energy, the meters from supplier do not have, does not have discounts on these. On the other hand though, um, energy meters from energy suppliers receive a reduced feed-in tariff for the surplus electricity fed into the grid. The energy imported from and exported to the grid is netted against the single point of coupling, which is the summon the summon um, which is the total meter of the building. Behind the summon private meters register consumption for each tenant, as we can see again in the diagram, the little um, circles with the M in them. In fact, it is not compulsory for all tenants in the building to have the same energy supplier. That's why we, uh, the, um, the meters from supplier still have to meter the single consumption of the tenants behind the sum and cellar. Regarding the model of ownership of the generation assets, in this case we have a PV system on the roof, they can be, so the only constraints to apply the Mitterstrom um, tariff and the Mitterstrom scheme is that the system operator must be um, the energy provider as well. So there should be this identity between the system operator and the energy provider. Therefore, the um, generation assets can be owned by the tenants, by the real estate agency that owns the building, or by the energy supplier itself. In terms of how does the scheme can be implemented, let's have a look at the diagram. Um, please follow me uh, with this little number 
that we have put in the diagram for a better understanding. So let's start from number one. The power generation coming from the PV roof is metered by the meter strong supplier and then sent through a boost bar into the building. At this point, the tenants receive a mix of energy generated by the rooftop PV and balancing services coming from the grid. Each, tem each tenant is metered through an individual meters that commonly belong to the energy supplier, but this is not a must. The meters from supplier nets off the sum of the individual meters against the building total meter reading and charge individual tenants accordingly. Now uh, let's have a look at the price of a meter strom tariff. Jeremy, um, I think you didn't give me the... Uh, okay, can you change the slide for me? You've got control. You need to have the pointer on the main screen. Um, there you go. Okay. So, uh, yes, let's have a look at the meter strom tariff then. So, in general, as Jeremy has showed, the energy tariff, at least in Europe, has three components. Cost generation, grid fees and taxes. A meter strom supplier will be able to avoid grid fees which in Germany constitute around a good 20% of the final cost, and therefore have a bigger revenue margin on its sales. However, the legislation of the Mitterstrom imposes to the Mitterstrom energy supplier to offer an energy tariff that is at least 10% cheaper than other regional energy tariff. Nonetheless, the energy supplier can maximize its revenues through the sale of excess generation through a reduced feeding tariff and trading flexibility services. The tenants who join the meters from skin will have to pay a combination of energy coming from the rooftop and therefore subject to discounts and electricity coming from the grid and therefore not discounted. However, this still allows a reduced energy tariff for meters from customer and a bigger revenue for the energy provider. Now, I would like to show you a case study that uh, we oh, okay. uh, that we have looked at uh, in Germany. This is the uh, Duisburg case study. Okay, so the project developer is Solar Imo, which have collaborated with a cooperative of citizens that owns a residential building in a part of in Aikenhof, which should be uh, a part of Duisburg. I'm sorry if I if I make a mistake. Um, the PV installation size, as you can see in this uh, um, scheme, is 90 kilowatt peak and it has a generation of 79 megawatts hour per year. And because of the size, it is still eligible for the reduced feeding tariff. Let's remember that there is uh, uh, systems are eligible for feeding tariff in Germany until today up to, so with size up to 100 kilowatt peak. Um, in this specific case, Solar Imo, the project developer, have cut costs by not installing a storage system. And it aimed to involve as many tenants as possible to increase self-consumption in the building. At the moment, they have um, involved 69 tenants. Now, let's move on to the energy model itself. Thank you. So um, let's focus your attention on the central columns, the one with the entities. So we can see that so solar emo uh, in uh, light blue um, installs the PV and the meters in the building to facilitate the sales of renewable energy to the tenants. 
Solar Emo owns, operates, and manages the PV system. It pays balances services to the DNO. It also receives payments for energy contracts from the tenants. And it also receives a reduced feeding tariff when, uh, when it's able to feed energy into the grid. The cooperative, which is called the Bonus Genossenschaft of Duisburg Sud, um, owns the building and receives rent from the roof, for the rooftop use from Solar Emo. The tenants rent the, rent the apartment, so they pay the cooperative for the rent, and they have the option to buy electricity from Solar Emo, which will always be 10% cheaper than um, a normal regional tariff. So this is um, the model of, uh, yeah, this is an example, a very simple example of the Meterstrom applied and running in Germany. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later on and I pass it over to Jeremy for, to wrap up the presentation. Okay, thanks very much for that, Ludovica. Uh, mm -hmm. very um, just a, a summary now of what we've talked about in terms of the uh, potential opportunities from each of these business models. And as we said earlier, um, the successful nature of a business model depends on what you define success as. Um, and in the case of some of these innovative business models, their primary purpose is actually about social engagement, uh, encouraging um, society and communities to engage with the energy transition. It's also a source of funding, which is um, uh, avoids public sector investment. And of course, there are other societal and environmental benefits. So we shouldn't necessarily judge their success in terms purely of their economic viability, uh, certainly not at this stage. Um, but what we've also seen is that self-consumption models can be economically viable today. Um, microgrids show many benefits beyond the self-consumption in terms of providing resilience, but of course they're also uh, more capital intensive than just um, conventional campus systems. Um, and this table here is really uh, an indication of the, the different values which can be attributed to the different business models in very general terms. Um, the, the column, uh, the tariff avoidance column is, is really just an indication of the fact that with self-consumption and microgrids, then you can avoid 100% of the, the, the tariff costs in most cases. And there are some markets where you still, as um, uh, Lodo was just explaining, where you still may pay some of the um, uh, um, emissions taxes. Um, but for the community renewables and transactive energy models, generally you're only looking at the energy content um, again, that may change as we look at different models for charging um, the use of system charges. Um, so if you just take the example of self-consumption at the top there, uh, it avoids 100% of the tariff. It can provide flexibility services, particularly if you use uh, aggregators to, to, um, to capture a number of uh, schemes. It can't do much in terms of resilience because it's still grid connected and will still trip out in the case of grid failure. Uh, it can usually capture the, the, any available subsidies. And of course, because it is um, self-consumption, it avoids use of system charges. And therefore we would judge it has overall quite a high economic value as do microgrids. Um, and as you'll see in that total economic value column on the right-hand side there, um, the virtual systems are quite challenging. The community renewables is an interesting one because although it can be simply a generation scheme, in some cases, what started out as community investment in a wind farm, for example, may now have a direct connection between the generation asset and the, um, the community that they serve, and effectively them evolving into pseudo uh, collective self-consumption schemes in some cases. So that's an, an interesting development from them. But anyway, so that's the, the overall summary. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention and um, Please feel free to um, type any questions into the chat function. Um, and I think Lucy's been keeping a tab on the questions as they come in. So, um, Lucy, 
what questions do we have that we need to respond to? Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I thought I'd maybe start with some that sort of address the beginning bit of the presentation. Two of the slightly similar. One asking whether we include community energy in our definitions of local energy systems. And then a very similar question to that. Are there any rules regarding the size or energy use of microgrids? Uh, I'll take the last question first. Uh, simple answer is no. Um, other than that below a certain level, um, you end up with what people generally refer to as nanogrids. So, for example, if you take um, an office block, which may be, say, 100 kilowatts peak, um, that could be considered a, a microgrid if it is, has the other characteristics of um, uh, island ability. Um, but when you look at uh, individual household level, for example, most people would not consider those microgrids. Uh, those would be nanogrids. Um, but in theory, there is no definition. If you look at the official definitions of microgrids, the characteristics are that they must be islandable, that they should be largely balanced supply uh, and demand within the, the microgrid, but there's no real size definition. Um, so that's the, the second question. I forget the first one was energy, community energy. Yes, um, and how do we integrate that into our LES typology? Um, it depends what you mean by community energy. So some people use that to mean, um, for example, district heat and power schemes. Um, others think of it in terms of energy communities. So it's a little bit confusing, but they do fit in. So community energy schemes could be, generally would be within the um, uh, the middle part of the, the typologies, depending on their actual configuration. So in the case where We've seen some cases actually, and maybe a lot of you might want to talk about the, the Swedish example. Sorry, you wasn't Lucy, the, the Swedish example, and Vorgorda, um, which is an energy community uh, using, um, is supplying the entire power within that network. Um, but others are virtual systems which effectively become um, collective self consumption schemes. Uh, Lucy, do you want to quickly mention about the Vorgorda scheme and how that works? Yes, so Vorgorda is an example in Sweden. They have community buildings. So each house is a privately owned flat. Sorry, my, my mistake, I should clarify. Each apartment building has privately owned flats and therefore they have communal access. And in that communal access, they have integrated hydrogen storage, which means that they have year round power. The whole point of this scheme was that in Sweden, they have obviously significant variable temperatures between summer and winter. And the point was this, this specific community wanted to ensure in a way their energy resilience. So they, they made this scheme. And as far as we know, it's one of the very few schemes that are allowing renewable generation all year round. Because one of the, the fundamental issues with renewables is either really windy or really sunny. But using hydrogen, they can capitalise on the PV generation during the summer. There is a case study for that, and I'm more than happy if anyone has more specific questions on it, just ping me an email and I can always give you a quick call to talk through the specifics. Great. Um, do we have time for a couple more questions, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, we've got another 10 minutes or so. So the next one is that there's a couple about the scalability and transferability of collective consumption models. Maybe you can address that one quickly. Uh, probably if uh, Rita's able to, if she's on the line now, that Probably more her feel. I'm happy to if uh, she's not available. But uh, Rita, could you take that? Rita's not on the line, Jeremy. Not at all. Still okay. Fine. Um, so scalability. Um, that depends on the market. Peer-to-peer um, -peer schemes um, aren't really limited by scale. Um, those tend to be very much virtual trades between uh, prosumers and consumers, uh, intended to be local. But in fact, there are instances in Netherlands, for example, a company called Power Peers, where um, the trades can take place, the matching, we say, takes place across the whole of the country. Um, some of them have a similar scheme in Germany where uh, they're trading across the whole country. Collective self-consumption generally is geographically limited. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the extent to which the different uh, countries of the EU have decided what that limit is can be uh, geographical in, in the sense of just physical distance. Um, I think the French system is the limit is uh, I think one kilometre from 
you know, the, the radius of one kilometer within which the community uh, can exist. Um, in other cases, it's based on voltage levels. Um, so if you are within a low voltage system uh, and you and all the training takes place within that, that's the other constraint. But um, it, it's pretty unclear because different countries at the moment are um, introducing their own, as they transposing the, the new directives in different ways. And I think it's going to take quite a while before the dust settles and we have any kind of common understanding. Uh, and as I say, Rita's been producing a report, uh, which I think is a very publication on the different business models for collective cell consumption across Europe, um, in which he looks at things like Metastron, for example, but also the, the French example. And uh, I think Greece has a very different system, which is which actually I think is one of the few which is not geographically constrained. Um, so yeah, so it's a wide variety of um, uh, scales that these things can operate at. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so next sort of group of questions that have come in are concerning sort of the erosion of value you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, maybe you could just clarify what we mean by taking value from the DSO network and possibly giving it to the microgrids or local energy systems. Yes, well, when we talk about erosion of value, it's, it's erosion of value in the sense that if you self-consume your own generation um, within your premises, you don't use the energy system beyond that. Um, other than for balancing power, which you pay uh, for as, as normal. Um, so from the, uh, the generator's point of view, it's an erosion of value. Um, of course, if you are the network operator, then you need to be paid for your investment. So as far as they're concerned, they are still recovering their investment for building the assets and operating them. Um, so effectively, what we're saying is that you need a network to, destroy, to distribute the, um, the electricity, and it's really a matter of whether the incumbent is managing that or whether you have, uh, in the case of greenfield development, for example, you build a microgrid and you, uh, as a microgrid operator, own the generation assets, the cabling and so on. Um, and you're still recovering the uh, investment for your cabling, but you're doing it within the uh, the, the self-consumption limit of a boundary of your, your network. So it's not really destroying value, it's just eroding it from the perspective of the person who is the generator in, in general terms. So in the case, for example, of a uh, community-owned wind farm, if they supply that electricity directly to um, their customers within a microgrid, then the only use of system charge is what they decide they need to recover for their investment. If, however, you have a wind farm adjacent to a uh, housing development where you are simply putting the, um, the uh, wind generation into the public network and then distributing it to the houses, you will be liable for the full use of system charges because you're using the full system. So that's what I mean by erosion of value. It's really just a, um, from the perspective of the generator, it's an erosion of value. I hope that answers the question. Are there other questions similar to that which you think might need further clarification? Sort of two prongs of questions that have come from that. One on resilience, so how the um, erosion of value impacts that. And second, on the ethics of it and whether by changing who pays what, that's negatively impacting certain members of society. OK, uh, I'll take that one first. That, that's a really important question. Um, when I talked earlier about you know, the, um, the fair charging mechanisms for the user system, um, I think we have to accept that if we are going to have this kind of innovative energy system, that the, the models that we've seen in the past in terms of charging methodologies are going to need to change. Now, clearly, the uh, people who make those investments, the DNOs or whoever who make the investments, need to have a reasonable return on their investment. Um, the question then is how that is achieved. Um, and in the example where, um, let's say, a substantial proportion of customers within a network are trading amongst themselves, um, still using the system, but uh, effectively not paying the, the going rate for it, then you're absolutely right. There is this uh, ethical issue about disenfranchising certain members of the community who maybe uh, don't have the resources to invest in the, the community energy company. Um, and those are genuine questions that have to be, be answered. 
Um, and that's why we need to find some way of uh, charging methodology which reflects both the values and the costs of using the system. And that could be capacity payment, it could be locational pricing, um, any number of methodologies. Um, and that is you know, very early stages where um, different countries are exploring different approaches to that. Uh, you asked me two minutes ago, resilience, yes, um, about the values of resilience. Um, interestingly, that, that keeps coming up at the moment um, in the context of the um, coronavirus issue. Um, and I think that people are conflating the word resilience uh, in two contexts. So one is about business continuity type resilience and the other one is about the uh, energy supply resilience. And so far, um, it seems that the energy industry in Europe has managed perfectly adequately. Um, that, uh, as far as I'm aware, there have been no issues around um, uh, the uh, security of supply um, in any of the European states. Um, but the issue then is about resilience of um, businesses. Um, and, and I think that, that's a very different issue. Um, and the question we have been asked previously, in fact, one of the questions that came in before the, the, the webinar asked about how we saw the, the COVID impact um, in terms of resilience and, and so on. And, and I think that probably the, the major impact it will have is it will make people uh, conscious of black swan events. Um, I don't think there's really much an argument about, you know, not importing our electricity from China. Um, but I do think that people uh, are becoming aware that the, the normal reality that they had expected is no longer the norm. Um, and that it may just stimulate some uh, innovative and creative thinking about how we uh, expect our energy system to uh, evolve in the future. So I don't think it's a direct impact. I think it's more just a, um, a thought stimulus uh, more than anything. Um, the other area it may have some impact, um, the coronavirus um, issue that is, is in terms of localization. I think that people have become very aware of their depends us not only on the global economy, but also um, the benefits of becoming more engaged with their community. And this is um, purely anecdotal, but certainly the experience that I'm seeing is that uh, communities are starting to be much more collaborative. Uh, people are much more conscious of their neighbours. You're getting people who are you know, dropping letters to your letterbox saying, you know, let me know if you want your shopping done, things like that. So I, I think that the, the localization agenda could be a major um, beneficiary from the, uh, the current situation. But it's not a resilience issue per se. Wonderful, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, slight change of track, but another attendee has asked the key differences between peer-to-peer -peer trading and collective self-consumption. Okay, uh, that, that's very simple. I think that one of the slides does uh, note it down, but just to clarify that, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, as we use the term certainly, is a trade between two well, as the name suggests, peers. So um, generally between consumers uh, who may or may not have um, PV. So uh, if I have a PV system on my roof and I use most of the energy myself, but I have some excess, I may want to trade that with somebody who doesn't. So rather than just exporting it and getting a feed-in tariff, I may sell it to, to my neighbor or somebody down the street who um, has either a deficit of uh, energy from their own system um, or who doesn't have a, a generation of their own. So that's my individual trade between me and one other person. Uh, collective self-consumption is more about uh, commonly owned assets. So the example we gave was uh, an apartment block where it, there's no space to install PV on your, uh, your, your roof because it, you don't have a roof. Um, and therefore you have a communal asset on the roof which is shared amongst the tenants um, and for reasons of physics, you need to be able to somehow allocate that energy um, to people. So there's generally a virtual trade. Um, and that's that effectively is what the Metastrom system does. So that, that's the difference. One is a individual to individual. The other one is community to individual. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. And the last one, I think, is more of a, of a clarification one. We specifically talk about collective self-consumption in Germany in this webinar. Can you give some sort of idea as to how broad these sort of models go into different European countries? Uh, yes, if I had another hour or so, I could happily do that. Um, as I say, so Rita's producing the report at the moment. Um, 
I think that she's identified three major types of business models across the European Union. But um, by law, all 28 member states need to uh, transpose the directives into their national legislation. Some are more advanced than others, but um, various types of collective self-consumption are being introduced in, in each of the, the European member states. Uh, okay, some more advanced than others. Germany is, is pretty well advanced with, with theirs. Um, France is being quite experimental, and I think they're um, coming to, I, I need to check with Rita, but I think that it's, um, they, they have a 12 month program where they're seeing how these different pilots work in both technical and um, economic terms, and then they'll review the legislation to see what needs to be changed. Um, but yes, but there are, there are different models in, in each of the um, uh, European member states. And I, as I say, about three generic types of models that are being introduced. Um, but yeah, Rita's really the expert. I'm sorry that um, she's had technical problems and not get on the, the call. Okay, uh, maybe one quick question if that's okay. We've got a couple of minutes left. There's been some discussions in the chat about multi-vector energy systems. Yes. Do we have any examples of them and are there cases to have multi-vector energy systems rather than just say PV ones? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, they, uh, we, we've been looking at a number of case studies for various levels of complexity. So the one that you mentioned earlier, the, the Volgorda one, which is um, interseasonal storage using hydrogen. So that is a uh, power to gas to power system. Um, there's uh, quite a large scheme up in Orkney where they have uh, interseasonal storage. Again, uh, they have excess wind generation and they uh, convert that to hydrogen, which is then used in transport uh, and in combined heat and power systems. So they've actually got a, uh, is it power to gas, to generation, to heat and mobility. So that is a, a you know, very multi-vector system. Um, the business models there are more complex. We have done case studies on those. Um, and um, we have, I think, uh, at least half a dozen case studies from the UK, which look at uh, multi-vector systems, um, say including the Orkney one. Um, but other markets as well, we, we've looked at various multi-vector systems. And I think that one of the key uh, features of the, I think, the more innovative systems is that they do exploit these multi-vectors in order to optimize the system. Um, the more diverse loads you can have and the more um, sectors you can cover, then the more likely it is that you can stack values and, um, and unoptimize the value of the investment. But at the moment, many of those are quite complex. Um, and again, it's something which will no doubt evolve with time. And we're continuing to, to monitor that uh, in terms of doing case studies, which we think are a really useful way of understanding both technology and the economics uh, of uh, local energy uh, space. Thank you for that, Jeremy. We are at 11, but do you have any closing comments just before we say goodbye? Um, I think just to say uh, thank you for attending. Um, the, uh, we will be, as I say, doing uh, further webinars on um, local energy systems. Um, as long as this uh, situation continues, um, that's going to be probably uh, more common than a face-to-face -face meetings with most people. Um, so the last slide, which um, includes the details, contact details for each of the, the team members, um, please feel free to contact us. The, our emails are there. Uh, happy to talk to you about the work we're doing um, and yeah as I say thank you for, for, for joining and you can see the webinar um, that will be on our website uh, and uh, if you need uh, copies of the slides please contact us and we'll be happy to, to send those to you as well. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I think that's it for us, for us for now. Thank you. <laughs>